So this is a summary of the AQA required practicals. Now the ones in blue are if you're doing the GCSE physics only, but the ones which are just in white are the ones with a combined award. Now the thing is, depending on what equipment you might have at your school, you might be doing these in different ways. And when it comes to the exam, they might ask you about some of these methods, or they might be using this equipment that you've used before, maybe in a slightly different way. So let's begin by looking at specific heat capacity. So this is the equation linking the change in thermal energy with the mass of something, the specific heat capacity and its change in temperature. Now, in order to find the specific heat capacity, again, there's different ways of doing this, uh, but that means we need to know the energy supplied to something, we need to know how heavy it is, and we also need to look at its change in temperature. Now, if you're looking at a solid, you might have one of these blocks here. So what you do is you'd have this electric heater, and what you do with this is you would measure things like the current and also the potential difference. Now, the power transferred uh, is going to be equal to the potential difference times the current and then to work out the total energy you're going to be multiplying the power by the time. So the energy transferred is equal to the power times the time. Um, another way you might be doing it is you might be having a liquid. So here you'd have maybe a beaker. Again you'd have this metal heater inside it and your thermometer and around this you'd make sure that there's plenty of insulation and a lid on top to reduce any heat losses. And again, what you're doing is you're just heating up this thing. So there's different ways you can interpret your data. It might be that you plot a graph. Now, if you plot a graph like this, um, you've got your temperature change up the side and the energy transferred here. You can then work out the gradient of this part of the line. And what you can then do is find that your specific heat capacity is one divided by the mass times the gradient. Depending on which equipment you use at school, effectively you've got a known mass of either a solid or a liquid. You're heating it up, and when you heat it up, you need to measure the current, the potential difference, and the time in order to work out the energy transferred. You can then plot a graph, and then you work out your specific heat capacity from 1 over mass times the gradient. Now, investigating the effectiveness of different materials as thermal insulators, um, there's different ways to do this. A simple way is you'd have a beaker. Perhaps inside this beaker you've got some water and then you have your thermometer. So in this investigation, uh, what you can do is you can look at the rate of energy transfer by maybe recording the temperature at different times. You can then repeat it using different amounts of insulation or different materials that surround it, remembering that you keep certain things the same. So you might, for example, use a cardboard lid each time to reduce any evaporation and heat loss from the top, and then you're just really looking at the different materials and how these help as an insulator. So this one here, um, pretty straightforward to do, and then you can maybe plot your data with a graph, uh, or it might be a bar chart if you're looking at different types of material. For this one here, when you set up circuits to look at the length of wire, what you need is some kind of power supply, maybe a cell or a battery. You have an ammeter that you connect in series, um, and then you'd have your sample of wire. So this is a piece of wire, and you can measure the length of that wire. You also have a voltmeter that goes in parallel across it. Now the reason for this is that if you know the current and the potential difference, you can work out resistance where resistance is equal to the potential difference divided by the current. Um, you'd also have a varying length of wire here, so you've got a different length of wire each time. And what you should see then is that as you have a bigger length of wire, you should find, hopefully, that the resistance increases. You double the length of wire, you double the resistance. Something else you, you can also look at is resistors in series and parallel. And for this, you do exactly the same you'd have your ammeter, your voltmeter, and rather than having a piece of wire here, what you'd have instead would be a combination of resistors. And you'd make sure that uh, the voltmeter went across both of these. Now, what you should find is that as you have more resistors in series, the total resistance goes up. But if you had resistors in parallel, then the total resistance should decrease. Next, we need to look at circuits to investigate the IV characteristics of resistors, lamps, and diodes. Again, it's a very similar circuit to the one that we have over here. Uh, you're still measuring the current and you're going to be measuring the potential difference. But what we can do is we can use a variable resistor. And this then allows us to change the current and potential difference across a component. Now, in this point here, I've put an X. That's where you put your component. Now, 
you then um, take values when you've got a positive value of current and a positive value of potential difference, and then you just need to swap the cell around so it faces the other direction to get values which are negative. You should find that when you plot these on a graph, so you've got I and V, you should find that a resistor is a straight line that goes through the origin. When you have a filament lamp, it does something like this, and that's because the resistance changes. A diode is tricky to do, especially when the current is going the other direction, but when you look at the IV characteristics for this, it should be negative or should be zero when the potential difference is one way, and then it rises steeply like that. But this one here is difficult to get the readings from. Next, we're looking at density, and the density is equal to the mass divided by the volume. Now, in all cases, uh, you can find out the mass using a mass balance, and that should then give you your mass in kilograms or grams. To work out the volume, it's a bit more tricky. Now, for a regular object, it might be a cube. You can work out the volume by using a ruler or some calipers or a micrometer, and then the volume of a cubic uh, shape like this is just going to be equal to length times width times height. If you, and the same if you had a, um, another regular object like a cube, it would just be length times length times length. Irregular objects are a bit more tricky because here you can't just measure the dimensions. Instead, what you can do is use a Eureka can and then you also have a measuring cylinder. And when you put the object and you completely submerge it under the liquid, you've then got your object in here and this displaces an equal volume of water. And if you have a liquid, this is actually pretty straightforward, you just have that liquid in a measuring cylinder, um, and then if this liquid's in the measuring cylinder, you can just read off the volume directly. Remembering, of course, that one milliliter is the same as one cubic centimeter. Next, we're gonna look at the relationship between force and extension for a spring. So for this, you need some kind of retort stand, and at the top of this, you hang your spring, and you measure the initial length. You then add masses onto the bottom, or you add weights onto the bottom, and this causes the spring to get longer. And what you're then measuring, if that's the initial length of the spring, is we're measuring the extension, so how much longer it's got. And you also should remember that 100 gram mass is approximately one newton. You should also find that provided you don't go beyond the elastic limit, when you look at the force that's being applied to that spring and the extension, you get this linear relationship. And what we find is that the gradient here is equal to the spring stiffness. Um, so K is equal to our force divided by extension, and you find that by looking at the gradient of the line. Investigating the effect of acceleration of the force on a constant mass, a standard way of doing this is you have your lab bench, and at the end of this you have a pulley. And what you then have is one of these physics trolleys connected with a piece of string. It goes over the pulley, and then you have a mass down here, a weight, which is providing the force which causes this to get quicker. Now for the first one, you vary the force by adding different masses on here, but we need to keep a constant mass. And the key thing is that the total mass of the truck and the weight, because it's all accelerating, has to stay the same. So the way that you do this is you'd have um, some masses on top. And what you do is you take the mass from the top and you put it onto here, and that means your total mass of the thing stays the same, but you're changing the force, because that means the force which is pulling down, the, the weight acting down, is going to be bigger each time. If you vary the mass for a constant force, that means you just keep the same thing on here, and you maybe just add masses to the trolley on the top. Does that make sense? There's kind of a subtle difference between the two. For the first one, you keep the tote, you're just changing mass from here to here. For the second one, you're just adding mass to this, and that stays the same. You then have some kind of data logger. Uh, depending what your school has used, there might be a force sensor or an accelerometer, which gives you a reading of the um, acceleration directly. It might be that you're using light gates or you're timing it to work out the speed to then work out the acceleration, which is what you're trying to measure. What you should find, what you should find is for a, the same mass but an increasing force, the acceleration gets bigger. But when you have the same force but you're varying the mass, as you get something bigger, the acceleration goes down. So you get a graph that looks a bit like this. The next one is looking at the frequency, wavelength and speed of waves in a ripple tank and waves in a solid. So the ripple tank, um, this is kind of a top-down view of it. And you might have a kind of dibber or something that goes up and down. And what you can then is you can read the frequency of that off the signal generator. So that gives you your frequency. You can then measure the wavelength 
um, either by using your phone, for example, which would then give you a slow-mo image, which you could then pause, and you can then measure the wavelength, especially if you have a grid by the side that shows this. Sometimes you can also use a strobe light, and if you get that just right and it matches the frequency, we then effectively freeze the image of the waves, and you can then measure that using a ruler. Um, for waves in a solid, the way that we tend to do this is, again, we have a signal generator connected up to a vibration generator. This is then connected to a string that goes over the edge of a bench. And if you get this just right, what we do is we set up lovely standing waves in the spring, uh, in the string, sorry. So what you see is that that um, string kind of starts to oscillate wildly. You can then read off the frequency of your signal generator. You can measure the wavelength um, using a ruler, and then you can use that to then work out how quickly that wave is moving. To look at the reflection of light, uh, we can have a mirror that we set up. We then use a ray box and we can shine a ray of light at that mirror. You then draw in a normal uh, at 90 degrees to the surface and then you can mark out where that reflected ray goes. Perhaps you see a ray that comes out here, you draw a couple of crosses and you join up the dots with your ruler. You can then measure the angle of incidence and the angle of reflection. You can do something similar when it comes to looking at refraction. So maybe this is a glass block. And once again, you shine a ray of light at it. You draw in your normal line, and then you just put a couple of crosses or maybe a point where that uh, ray of light comes out. You can then join it up using a ruler. And then once again, you can measure the angle of incidence and the angle of refraction. You should find that for reflection, I is equal to R. But for refraction, you should find that I, if it's something maybe going into glass, the light slows down and I is bigger than R, the angle of refraction. And this one here, looking at infrared radiation, uh, this is where we're often thinking about things which are matte black, which are brilliant absorbers and emitters, or shiny silver, which is a poor emitter and poor absorber. So one way you could do this is you could set up two beakers. One of them is silver, one is matte black. In each of these, you could have your thermometer, and then you have some liquid in both. And you can also have a lid along the top to stop any heat uh, leaving that way. Now you'd make sure that one is silver and one is black, or you can change different colors to investigate it. What you can then look at is how quickly that uh, temperature drops. Effectively, the greater the temperature drop, the greater the amount of infrared radiation being emitted. So you can look at that for silver and black. Uh, the other way you can do it is if you had maybe a heat source and then you had two of these um, thermometers, or you can even use data loggers to actually record it digitally rather than have to take manual readings. You could look at how maybe um, a silver coated thermometer changes its temperature compared to a black, matte black painted thermometer if they're both the same away from a heat source. So that's investigating how much that uh, infrared radiation is absorbed by the thermometer. So that is just a really quick summary of the AQA practicals. You will have done these at school. You might have used different methods. Something that's important to do when it comes to looking at exam questions is maybe thinking about your independent variable, the one that you decided to change, how that affected your dependent variable, and then also the control variables that you kept the same each time to make sure it's a fair test. Again, when it comes to your method, you've got to think about the equipment that you use. So label it very clearly, and diagrams do help. Think about uh, the measurements that you take and how you had accurate measurements. And also think about any safety considerations. For example, things get hot if you're looking at specific heat capacity. You've got electric currents here, which can potentially be a bit dangerous. You've got liquids which might spill and cause a, a kind of a trip hazard. You've got masses and weights which might fall on the ground and cause somebody an injury. So there are no big risks. I mean, it's, it's pretty safe doing GCSE physics, but you've always got to make sure that you think about any of the hazards and then how you control these if you're doing the experiment. So those are the AQA required practicals.